Well, good morning, everyone. And we're glad that you're uh, in the house here. And if you're watching online this morning, God bless you. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. If you're catching this after the fact, God bless you. And I trust you enjoy the time that we've shared together. And we'll enjoy the meeting as it continues on. Just a reminder to the ladies that there is a shower next Saturday for Carrie. And if you want to be part of that event, you need to talk to my wife or to Linda after the service this morning. If you want to be part of a group gift, then, uh, yeah, you need to talk to them today <laughs> so that everything get everything together and organized for Saturday. And we're just looking forward to having a chance to start to share things with you. Well, we are moving into fall and... Uh, we're just wandering around for a couple of weeks in the Word. Is that all right with you? But can I tell you where we're going? I mean, you're curious. Right? Can I tell you where we're going? Well, let me tell you where we're going next week. We're going to start next week with how to bring out the best in your kids. Or anybody else. And some of you are looking at me because you're over 20 or under 20. You say, what in the world will I be doing coming to church for that? Let me tell you how, why, you would, why you would come. Number one, because everybody else sat there while you went through it. Number two, better reason yet. I have preached this series more times than you know. Can I be frank with you? I used the same set of principles when I preached this series, how to bring out the best in your mate and how to bring out the best in your friends and co-workers. Can I tell you that it's the same principles? And all I'm going to do is morph and do the stats for the kids? Can I tell you that it's the Bible and it just works? And so the reason you would come is because you need to reinvest in this again. Because this doesn't just work for your kids. Thank God it does. But it works with everybody. And the gospel is good news for everybody. And so that's why you would come and be part of the next three or four weeks. And we're going to work on how to bring out the best in your... Now, if you've got family member or friends that would particularly be benefit from this, why don't you make sure that they get online on Wednesday or Thursday uh, when, once Caitlin gets the sign-up thing up because uh, we're going to plug up the house pretty fast. Can you imagine that? And, uh, but we want to make sure that you're part of it. Next Sunday morning, Rachel's already got the word out to the, the teachers. Next Sunday morning, we want to relaunch into Sunday school. We've got some large spaces and some small spaces in the basement so that if the parents are coming for Sunday morning for what we're going to talk about, we've got your kids, all right? We got them. And so those spaces have been prepared, and uh, we're getting ready. Rachel just said to me, she said, you know, I think we should let them go to school for a couple of weeks before we try this. Then they know how the rules work, and we're not trying to tell them anything that they don't already know. How many think that's that a good idea? And so that's what we're going to do. And so next week, not this coming week, but the next week, we'll get rolling with youth. And Caitlin's been doing some things with young adults. Have you seen her ride that she's going to do for World Missions? And if you haven't, then get back online and have another look. Because there's lots of good things going on out there. And we want you not to miss out this fall as things begin to come back into alignment again. Well, can I tell you that this week the ultimate deception has happened? Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, the ultimate deception has been perpetrated and people are loving it. And I'm struggling to see how much this hypocrisy is being, uh, how this is winning so much attention. But I'm telling you, it made, the, it made the front page of the National Post this week. You say, I can't read it from there. Oh, just a second, let me help you out with that. I just said, uh, yeah, the impossible burger, the veggie burger that bleeds is coming to Canada. Started this week, in fact, if you know where to get one. And uh, they're telling me that it can replace something I love. I, that's what I said, Pastor McLeans. You know, usually when we're being deceived with an imitation product and sorely overcharged, we scream in protest. But apparently nobody's screaming except for, where can I get one? 
Here's what it said in the report. It's an exciting week for Toronto vegetarians and flexitarians. That's what you are. As a cult favorite, the Impossible Burger makes its long-awaited Canadian debut. This flagship product from California based Impossible Foods is hitting the menus of 13 Canadian restaurants, marking its first availability outside of the continental U.S. and a few spots in Asia. The secret to the meat-like taste is a protein called soy lay hemoglobin, which is what turns the burger red. It actually looks like it's bleeding when you cook it. But this, 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 this particular kind of soy apparently is also, it's got an ingredient in it that is similar to what happens in real meat. And so that's what alters the flavor, just that little bit extra, so you're supposed to not know that you're having vegetables. They're trying to sneak more vegetables into my diet. I stand against it. Amen, brother. <laughs> my beloved burger's been counterfeited by something that apparently looks like, smells like, and tastes like beef, but it is not. Who can tell? Well, apparently only the cook and God. So they're trying to get me an extra serving of veggies, the ultimate hypocrisy. <laughs> well, the Bible talks about hypocrisy in very sobering terms. So I'll invite you to take a Bible with me, if you would, this morning, and go to the Gospel of St. Matthew. So Matthew's Gospel... We're going to read from verse 21 down to verse 26. We'll talk about setting and context and all that stuff in a minute, but let me read it to you. Here's what it says, Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 21. Not everyone, the Bible says, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus continues and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock the rain fell and the floods came. The winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on sand, no foundation. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell and great was the fall. Of it. Shall we pray? Father, we need your insight. We need your wisdom. As we look into your word, we want to know what you want. And we want to know what you intend. And we want to participate. Help us, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. And everybody said? Amen. So today we read two quick segments from the very end of what's most familiarly called the Sermon on the Mount. And the words he taught in this message were life-changing, as are all of the words of Jesus. And you would think that everyone who sat on the hillside that day had a life-transforming experience. But was it? Well, First of all, before we start answering the question, we better find out who Jesus is talking to, right? Because who Jesus is talking to always matters. So for that, we have to go back to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, because we find out at the end of verse 2, at the end of, at the end of chapter 4, that Jesus has been teaching to large crowds. They're coming to him from everywhere, but at this point, he hasn't even left Galilee. And the crowds that are gathering to hear him are seeing, and seeing, are seeing miracles. Many have been baptized and are following him as they are able. But then one after one day, Jesus takes a little different tack. And it says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain 
and sat down and his disciples, did you see that? Came to him. This is more than the 12. This is the people who have found Jesus as he's been preaching and teaching throughout Galilee. And they want what he's got. They want to know what he's doing. They are, want to be part of whatever it is is going on in his life. So Matthew calls them disciples, disciplined followers. So first of all, what you and I have to notice is this is not a message intended for broad-based consumption. The words in chapter 5 to 7 are to them and for them specifically. Those who call themselves disciples, followers of Christ or Christians. So what has he told them? Because as I told you, this is the end of the story, what we read this morning. So what did he tell them? Let's talk about it for a minute because that matters. If you read through the message, the standard set in chapter 5 to 7, the standard that Jesus sets for us is nothing less than perfection. You say, perfection? Oh yeah. He, he even said that. I mean, he said it right out. Chapter 5, verse 48. Therefore, you must be what? Perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. He lays it on the line. As we read through, we observe Jesus' use of black and white categories when he lays down a challenge that simply can't be converted into a set of rules and regulations for life in the real world. This thing can't go with the Pharisees into legalism. The essence of the kingdom and life as we may experience it here and now in that kingdom is in fact the antithesis of a legal code. In fact, he says that to them, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, the legalists of our day, you will never, did you see that? Never enter the kingdom of heaven. Legalism and a set of rules and ethical code is simply not going to cut it. So Jesus moves everything beyond the possibility of life by the letter of, law, of the law and pushes towards a life empowered by the Spirit. And I'll tell you that if you'll stop this afternoon, some of you have read this many times, and read it again with fresh eyes, here's what you'll say by the time you get halfway through. Here's the word, impossible. Impossible. There is just no way. And that is true. It's designed that way. You say, pardon me? It's designed so that you can't do it by yourself. You have to catch the wind of the Spirit. You have to learn to live a life yielded and empowered by the Spirit of God. You see, the teaching is intended to be a guide for life, but only for those who are committed to enter the kingdom of heaven. And even they will find that outside of the Holy Spirit's involvement and influence in their lives, everything Jesus calls you to exceeds your ability to grasp. So when we get to the end, where we were reading, Jesus exposes our human tendencies towards my favorite, public lecture. That's what I do for a living. Exposes our tendencies towards public lecture, listening, and public performance. We are the ones prone to be more concerned about believing than doing. You gotta believe the right stuff, you know. More about believing than about words and deeds. The first saying, especially that we read, is directed towards those who witness and testify and minister, whether it's in a public square or as a parent in the home. We are all called to be witnesses, to speak about Christ and represent him. And to such persons, Jesus says, do our lives align with what we're talking about? And the second saying, Jesus applies to all who take the place of the listener. 
And we're all hearers of the word who would consult our con who would consider ourselves disciples or Christians, and we hear the hard words of declaration about risks for the house of those who find Jesus' words important enough to hear, but not realistic enough to live. The Sermon on the Mount is not an ethical construct. It's not a philosophical discourse on ethics or morality as some have led us to believe. No, friends, this is a messianic manifesto setting out the unique demands and revolutionary insights of one who claims absolute authority over other people and whose word is the word of God. And that word of God, he tells you in the verses we read, will determine your destiny. So when we hear the issues and the challenge in our text that we must do the will of God or be cast out, we must hear the words and make sure that our foundation is sure or all that we are and do will be for naught. This sounds like, this does not sound to me like exciting news, but this is Jesus, friends. And what Jesus says matters. And if it doesn't matter to you, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Don't waste your time. Allow me to remind you that Jesus' commanding words are far more than only a list of demands or warnings. Friends, remember this in its proper context. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to redeem and to reconcile. He came to transform the lives of the people and not to drive them away. So while you hear this, you have to know he's not trying to push you out. He's trying to pull you in. But he's telling you that a lackadaisical attitude, I knelt at the altar and that was the end. I got in the tank and got my baptismal certificate and I'm good to go. It's not going to cut it now or then. You see, friends, there will be people who will go to hell empty-handed and tragically, there will be some, if I'm reading Jesus' words here correctly, who will go to hell with an offering envelope in one hand and a baptismal certificate in the other. He has come to reconcile and reclaim. He has come to shape us into his image, to change us, not to lose us. He came to mold and empower us and our will so that we can do the will of the Father. He came to write the words of life on our hearts so that, in fact, we will have God. The rock is our solid foundation under our lives. And it makes all the difference in the world that Jesus is the speaker. And you know his intention is to seek and to save. And that's not to say that you can just forget about the threat of judgment in our gospel reading. But we do need to hear them in the context of who Jesus was and what he was talking about. And he began his teaching that day with all kinds of blessings and promises and gifts and guidelines that would cut him out of our experiences in an ever-deepening relationship with him. So he began with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will get comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. These are virtues, not virtues demanded of us. They are empowering gifts to be given to us. See, Jesus wants to get you through, not to get you out. Whatever God has called you to do, 
I want me to assure you that he has gifted you to do it. For the gifts and the callings of God, the Bible says, are without repentance. If he's calling your name, he will gift you and bless you and strengthen you and encourage you. And he will not relent on that. He will give you what you need to get through if you will yield to him, his design and his desire. If you will yield to the Holy Spirit who will empower you to live the life that you and I, when we read five, chapters 5 to 7 in the book of Matthew, right across the page, impossible. But we get confused about this stuff. We start to think that kingdom life involves doing mighty works and operating in powerful spiritual gifts that are visible. What Jesus is attacking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when he says that it is simply not enough to say, Lord, Lord, he's telling us that's not enough because it involves a growing, developing relationship that leads you into the will of God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter. Consider with me, gathering as the body of the Christ, body of Christ for corporate worship, as we've done this morning, is vital. Fellowship in large and small groups for testimony, prayer, ministry, gospel community, that's a significant. Bible study, pers a personal devotional life is critical. But none of these things matter unless it comes out of a certain foundation. If it's a set of rituals that you're going through, I admire the habits you've adopted. But unless there is an undergirding that has to be there in the beginning, there's going to be problems. Because Jesus continues, because on that day, what is that day? Well, judgment day. At the end of time, when the books are opened and God sits down with you and me to talk about our lives and where they've been and how we've done, he said, on that day, many, did you see the many? I don't think Jesus is excited about this, but I think he's realistic. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not do these mighty, visible, spiritual activities? Were not we spiritually engaged? Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons and did mighty works. And his parting shot, because this is the last time he's going to see them. As they're sent off into an eternity without God. Are these words I never knew you now that's not to say that Jesus doesn't know your name because he does that's not to say that Jesus is not acquainted with your comings and goings for he is what he's saying is that you and I don't have a relationship you and I have no vital ongoing connection something is missing these folks are involved in spiritual things, but spiritual activity, write it down, spiritual activity is not a substitute for a relationship. I mean, people get to this point in their relationships all the time where they're going through the motions without connection. One day Frank comes home and Janice isn't there and there's a note on the table. He says in bewilderment to a pastoral colleague of mine, what happened? I never saw that coming. They were sharing sex and accommodations and finances and chores. But as far as Janice was concerned, they were two ships passing in the night. And there ceased to be a vital interpersonal connection between them. To a casual outsider, it might have appeared that all was well. But friends, all was not well. My wife likes to make me uncomfortable. How many of you can believe that? Yeah, I got a couple of amens, bless God, you know. And we're driving down the highway somewhere, 
And I'm focused on just getting us from A to B. How many of you men can identify? And out of the darkness comes this question. So how are we doing in our marriage? Oh, dear God. <laughs> what, 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 can, what can we do, Pastor, to make this better? She says, Pastor, sarcastically. <laughs> and as a typical male cut completely off guard, I stumble and fumble for an appropriate response. And I'm really grateful for her patience with me and her concern for us. Her question's well chosen and her intentions are certainly clear. And can I say to you, Jesus, Jesus is being equally clear here? You're flying down the highway of life and Jesus looks over and says, how are we doing? How can we improve this? <laughs> My kids are dying in the front row. <laughs> They've been in the car and watched their father melt into a puddle of I don't know what. <laughs> but Jesus' comments here suggest that at some point in the life of these disciples, there was a disconnect that happened between the spiritual activity and the vital relationship that would have had as its focus growing conformity to the will of God. Here's what I know. The longer that I'm married, the more I get to know and get familiar with the things that my wife loves and hates. Now, again, if you ask me to list them, I will just die. <laughs> On the spot, I stink at confrontation. Pastor Vic's good on the radio. You get a live caller, and he's got a shot back. And I'm but when he's done. By the time we're done the radio, he was done the radio show. I'm sitting at home thinking, I think I might have an answer to that. <laughs> and the show is done. I, I'm not one of those guys. I don't know if you can identify. But here's what I know. If you ask me to, to list all the things that my wife loves and hates, I'll falter. I'll put up a really good front, but thankfully, while I'm challenged for a quick response, over time, here's what's happened. I've developed a set of patterns, and I keep trying to add habits that I pray helps me capture some of those important items in the moment. You see, I'm not joking when I'm talking to you online about the habits of happiness and telling you that this is not a hit and miss situation. This is a series of things that are developed over time. That the way to build a relationship with Jesus is not 15 minutes of singing on Sunday morning. That's vital to your connection with God, but it's certainly not enough. If you don't talk to your wife for more than 15 minutes a week, Small wonder that you will come home to a note on the table. Now I confess that I miss cues all the time. If you doubt that, ask my kids. But I'm grateful for a wife of uh, 27 years. Thank God. <laughs> That was close, Mick. That was really close. <laughs> November the 6th. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, without a word of a lie, she had it inscribed inside my wedding band so that I wouldn't forget. <laughs> I am grateful for 27 years. And here's what I know. I've done an awful lot of changing. And you see, the point of recognizing the things that bring her joy and cause irritation is not to make her shut up or to get my kids off my back. Okay, so sometimes it is. <laughs> but the point of recognizing those things is to help me change. Because the first time it was funny, the second time it was frowning, and the third time there was tears. And all the men said, yeah, that was about it. 
because we missed it. And my aspiration in changing my habits and adjusting my attitudes as one who loves my wife deeply is to allow her to, co to continue to grow and our relationship to flourish and sometimes just to help her survive the stuff that life throws at all of us. Because anything that makes her life better makes my life better. My best friend said this, happy wife, how many of you can finish it? Happy life, happy life that's it. Friends, I change for love. Not diapers. Now, friends, I'm not done all the changing and adjusting. Trust me. I'm changing because I love her. And I also discovered the other reason I'm changing is because I can't make her change. Hello? Anybody out there? You say, why are you, why are you off on this rabbit trail? <laughs> Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I am the Lord. I change not. Who's not changing? Jesus. And if I'm going to be in a relationship with Jesus that's vital and full and flowing and free, there's going to be some adjustments required, and it won't be him. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that you know so well, says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the only way my relationship with God can improve, the only way I can demonstrate my love, not just to my wife and my family, but to my Lord, is if I will change and become like him. I just gave you a cue that is so huge, if you missed it, you better rewind the tape and listen again. Because here's what I also observe in this little pericope that we're looking at. That means a little section, okay, in case you're wondering. That was a nice word, though, wasn't it? Keep it. Pericope, there you go. When they said it the first time in my master's program, I looked at him and said, a pair of what? <laughs> a pair of cope? Oh, pericope, that's how you say that. Anyway, yeah, it just means a passage. Don't let anybody fool you. But what I observe as I read is that unlike the con consciously fraudulent prophets that you'll read about in Matthew 7 up in verse 15, these people are themselves more surprised than anyone when they find themselves rejected and ejected from the kingdom of heaven. The tone in the text of their words suggests they are absolutely incredulous. You can feel the shock. Lord, but Lord, Lord, have we not? Spiritual activity is no substitute for a relationship. Because the basis of their rejection is expressed not in terms of what they've done or not done, still less in terms of their allegiance that may have been publicly professed, but in devastating but poignant words, more shocking when addressed to these professing disciples, these words, I never knew you. Scares the life. So how does he characterize these people who think that they know him, but he doesn't? Oh, it's down there. He calls them workers of lawlessness. What does that mean? Well, didn't God lay out ten things? It was ten, right? And Jesus took it all and threw it aside and said, there's only one thing. A new commandment, I get a new commandment for a new covenant. The other set went with the old covenant. If you're not in Jesus, you're under that old covenant. You got the big ten and you better deal with that. If you're in the new covenant, you're in John chapter 13 and John chapter 15. You see, lawlessness just means that they weren't making the adjustments. They weren't doing what? Changing. 
They weren't doing anything to make this relationship work. They had settled in and gotten comfortable where they were in their faith and decided it's enough. This will get me through. And Jesus says, not a chance. He says they're workers of lawlessness. And Jesus is not suggesting that works merit salvation, but rather, as Pastor Mick told you when he spoke from James a month or so ago, maybe a little longer than that now, true faith and authentic relationship will not fail to produce the fruit of good works. It's about roots and fruit. It's not just about what you see, it's about where it came from. It's about roots and fruit. And it matters where it came from. The lawless ones don't keep the law. And Jesus said these words, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know what? That I love the Father. This is how you know. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the commandment wasn't hard. There was only one. Oh, it had all kinds of things that were attached to it. But his command was simply this. Love each other as I have loved you. And the lawless ones don't keep the law. Therefore, Jesus concludes they don't love him or the Father. And they're not actively engaged in trying to make this relationship work. So his response to them is this. Depart from me. I'm done with this. It's over now. Get lost. You see, that sounds really heartless. It will be at the time. I struggle to push people out of my circle that I know well. The people that I don't know, I have a lot less trouble with. And Jesus is having no trouble. Because he says... I don't know you. Matthew chapter 7, he goes on in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now I know that in Romans 10, 17, the Apostle Paul wrote that faith comes by hearing, but it's not the same as this hearing. You see, hearing has to do with doing. Authentic faith is always accompanied by action. I don't know if you know it or not, but the word obey or obedience, both in the English language and in the original Greek, have its root in hearing. The word means to hear. The derivation in the Greek Word, it literally means to be under the hearing. That's what it means to obey. In other words, to act on what you heard. So if someone yells, duck, and you go like this, what did you just do? Obey. You heard and you responded with action to show that you have heard. And this is the picture of faith in the New Testament. It's why St. Paul can write that faith comes by hearing because it's not just catching the audible. It includes acting on it when you get out of the huddle. It's similar to roots and fruits. Jesus used the illustration earlier in Matthew 7 for judging false prophets. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he says those that hear the words do them. Authentic disciples learn, he says, to yield to the Holy Spirit who empowers us to change, to demonstrate that we're truly building our lives on a solid foundation, that it matters to us. Jesus is not just laying out a bunch of conditions for us to meet. Rather, he's emphasizing how significant and important it is for us to hear his words so that in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed and grow this thing so there's not a note left on the table at the end of your life. Do hear these words. 
about the wise person who built his house on the rock in contrast to the foolish man who builds with no foundation. It's very tempting for us to put our emphasis first on building the house instead of on the matter of the foundation. Because nobody sees the foundation. Isn't that just the point? In Jesus' illustration, the two foundations are totally unseen. It's only the storm that reveals what's going on. And the storm comes to both houses. It's not that what was built for a house was inadequate in either sense. Not in this story. What matters to Jesus is did you anchor the house? Did you put down the house on the foundation? And friends, there is only one foundation. Look at this. For no one, Jesus, uh, Paul writes, can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus. There is no other foundation. Did you hear me? This is, the, I, I'm sorry for all of you that like to be universal, but this is not universal. This is all that there is. He said there is only one and all other ground, as the old hymn writer said, is what? Sinking sand. Sinking sand. That's it, friend. In fact, when Jesus tells the same story in another context, and Jesus repeats his sermons. How many of you know that? That makes me feel so much better. In Matthew chapter 6, he, 5 and 6 and 7, he's up on a mountain. In Luke chapter 6... He's down on the plane. And he tells this same story, but a little differently. And Luke tells us about the one that happened on the plane. Look at it with me for just a minute. Here's how he starts that story. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone, did you see that? Who comes to me and hears my words and does them. I will show you what that person is like. Watch this now. He is like a man building a, a house who did what? The Greek literally says, dug down deep. He made sure that between the foundation of his house, all the crap that culture brought, all the things that life had brought to him, got swept aside. Isn't that what happens at redemption when God forgives us all of our sins and all he takes it all and pushes it aside. He digs down deep and we make sure that there's nothing else on that foundation plate. And then he attaches the foundation to the rock. He dug down deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose and the stream broke against it, the house could not shake. Are you shaking? Is COVID-19 shaking you? Let me ask you a question. Where's the foundation, friend? Hello? Where's the foundation, friend? Because it's the man who does not hear, who does hear, but does not do. It's the guy without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, it immediately fell. You see, at the close of this discourse, Jesus has his hearers and leaves them with a simple but demanding choice. He said, you are my disciples and you can hear and ignore or you can be really my disciples and hear and put into practice. And while he applied it specifically to his words that day, I think they apply to all of the words of scripture for those of us who claim to be his disciples. And it's a make or break choice with eternal consequences, friends. As we noted in Matthew 7, 21, it's Jesus himself who is the key to the choice. It is his words which must be done. Indeed, Jesus' words here is the equivalent of doing the will of the Father in Matthew 7. Jesus is clearly aware that though all are listening, 
are disciples. Not all who hear what he calls for are equally ready to respond. And it all comes down at the end to doing. Because he said, if you love me, you will do what I say. You'll keep my commandments. And you say, how will I do that? This is impossible. Well, I'll tell you that the Old Testament prophet had it right. It's not by might nor by power, but it will be by my spirit, says the Lord. The only way forward for you and for me as we walk into this fall is to be in a committed, growing relationship with Christ. Listen, friends. God is in this to redeem humankind. He came to reconcile and to reclaim, not to drive people away. He came to shape us into his image, to change us, not to lose us. He came to mold us and empower our wills so that we can do the impossible. We can do the will of the Father. He came to write the words of life on our hearts so that, in fact, we will have God the rock as our solid foundation. But we must be eager, willing participants in the relationship. Friends, it takes two to tango. I, okay, I can't tango either, just in case you want. I don't dance. Two left feet, hallelujah. But friends, we must be willing, eager participants in relationship because here's what I know. Jesus says the storm will come. The wind will come rage and batter the house. The water will rise and push against the house. Friends, there is a storm coming. We may be in the beginning stages of it now. But he said if we will anchor our lives to the rock and daily yield to the spirit for transformation, growing ever deeper in our relationship with Christ, we will be tightening down the bolts into the foundation, Jesus Christ, and making our destiny sure. A house in a storm is only as secure as a foundation. So what have we learned? Religion, morality, or history with God is no substitute for a current, committed, vibrant relationship with Jesus. You can call Jesus Lord, but Jesus says in this text that talk is cheap. Those who enter the kingdom of heaven are not just those who confess Jesus with their lips, but those whose deepest desire and commitment is to follow through with words and the ways that Jesus is leading them in their lives. So what am I going to do? Well, you know what to do. You said, do you? Oh, here, listen, 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 listen. Let me show you. Gathering, participating in corporate worship as a community. This is a really big deal. Now, if you don't have any foundation, you can walk away from this and say, well, you know. But remember, worship is not about you. It's about the matter of fulfillment it has nothing to do with the fullness of your soul. It has to do with the fact that you will bless the Lord with all that is within you. Bless his holy name. And to be able to do it in chorus with others is a really big deal. Amen. Fellowship in large and small groups for sharing testimonies and prayer requests and ministry to one another. That's a really big deal. Are you meeting with anybody? Fellowship is a big deal. Weekly Bible study, you engage with the word and the spirit more deeply. Listen, we want to make sure that the bolts are down tight. Because we are... Coming up on the storm. Hello? You need a personal daily time, Bible reading, prayer. You need a personal time. You know what I mean? Not just to connect with God, with all of us or with a few close friends. That matters. 
But you need to connect with God, just you and Jesus. None of these things matter. Unless it's born out of an increasing desire for a deeper relationship and stronger connection with the foundation. Jesus Christ. Here's what I've learned. COVID-19 has put many of us in isolation. I've watched people get lulled into spiritual inactivity. Others have been so crazy busy that time for God and for fellowship with others, including their own families, has been put on the back burner. And let me tell you, it's showing in your face. But as fall begins, it's time to hit the reset button. It's time to determine to re-engage wherever, whenever, however possible with the body of Christ. To regain our spiritual footing in our families and begin to influence this city once again for Jesus. In fall 2020, we're not going to be locked down or locked out. I want you and I to be locked in to the plans and purposes of God for you. Let fall 2020, no matter what happens out there, be time. For you and for me to shine for Jesus. Can we pray together? Father, your word brings light, life, and hope to us. We are encouraged that you care enough to warn us of what is coming and what you're looking for and how we can avoid it and how we can engage with you. Thank you, God, that you just don't leave us out in the cold, but that you're very clear with your instructions. You call for us to come and then empower us to stay and empower us to live the way that you're calling us to live. Now, as we step into this fall, I pray for every Christian education teacher, for every small group leader. I pray for every family member every family leader. I pray for men and for women who are standing in this community and speaking for you that you will give them your words and your way and that you will give them that vital connection so that they'll know that they are walking hand in hand with their Lord. Bless each one now as we go our separate ways that our lives may accurately and adequately reflect you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, for his glory alone. Amen. Pastor Mick, can you come and wrap our service up today with a song, please?